welcome to the Build Business Acumen podcast, where we deliver practical knowledge and powerful guidance. Here is your futuristic host, Nathaniel Skula. Well, it's lovely to have a conversation with you, Nelly, again about this uh, really, really important topic. And in this in this conversation, we're going to talk about resilient people and we're going to share a little bit about you know how how we think they manage to control their emotions in order to not go crazy or you know frankly worse right and i know you did a lot of research into nelson mandela in 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 when we were writing the book so what um what do you th- what do you think about Nelson Mandela and, and his resilience? How, how do you think he he managed to build it? Yeah, I was thinking uh, that you know he there is an island, Robben Island, uh, where the prison is, and he spent first eighteen years there, and there were no plumbing and there were no bed. Eighteen years on the floor. So just to start off with that, and after that, it's another year, nine years come in. So he went up 5 a.m. every morning and he did his physical uh, exercises Mm -hmm. every morning. And he had the same routines every morning that he did his exercises and then he got some food and then he worked in the prison the whole day. And then coming back, he did these exercises and then he asked for a paper and pen, which he wasn't granted in the first years. It took him five years to have a paper and a pen. And after that, he started to write down his thoughts and his ideas and his philosophies. And he was saying maybe it wasn't a point to give him paper and pen because in the beginning he carried a lot of anger. I mean, I think who wouldn't? Uh, so he then, after this period when he started to write, he could started to observe himself. That was the only one he had uh, to uh, observe. So he then saw how he was changing him, himself. So after this 18 years, he, he was actually moved to another prison and um, he, uh, that he had some, it was a bit more comfortable. And the last two years, he was actually given a cottage. Um, And if you think, I mean, he lived, despite having had physically such a hardship, he still lived for 95 years. Think of the body that is enduring all of that, sleeping on a concrete floor for 18 years, and probably poor food and the rest and the mental stress. The body is fantastic and he was fantastic because he learned to build his strength without his body. He didn't take that into consideration, meaning that, yes, he did his daily exercises, but he made sure that he did not go into aches and pains from his body. He lived above that. And that is unbelievably beautifully done. I guess the only way how to survive a prison for 27 years. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about rising above the day to day, aren't you? In essence, yes. in yeah. some way of of uh, controlling your emotions, right? I mean, that's that's in mm. essence the core of resilience, right? Yes, indeed. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's been, a, like I say, you know, it, it's it's been a fascinating journey, and and I went to Auschwitz uh, back in 2020, and mm. uh, I visited Auschwitz, um, and at the time, I found it a very clinical. It was a very clinical place, and I ended up. I got to the end, and I and I and I saw all the shoes behind the glass wall, and uh, and then I got to the end, and I saw the. Um, display of uh people who'd made it out from from there and and what i found you know there were a lot of there were a few few there's an art exhibition as you come out and a lot of these people had kind of said 
they, they, they basically became, you could just see they were so grateful, right? And to be alive, yeah. And, and that led me into a journey of, of, of basically studying like Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning and, and also listening to the Anne Frank uh, diaries, which, were, which are on Audible actually now. And what I found really interesting was with both Anne Frank and uh, Viktor Frankl, they had, they had basically managed to control their emotions by hoping into the future. So they had used their imagination to create experiences in the future to look forward to. And I found that I found that whole process really, really very um, sad. But it was also it was also very it put a perspective, it, it gave me perspective on what many have been facing a difficult time. And it gave me this perspective that was different. It was a different perspective. And so I've used, I've used the way that, that they got through things by having humor. I mean, if you, if you haven't read Anne Frank's diaries, she had humor. I mean, she was only what, 13 to 15, I believe when, 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 when she went and eventually got killed, unfortunately, but 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 her story is so famous that and the way that she used humor the same as Viktor Frankl and and I think probably the same as Nelson Mandela because he was quite a humorous character I I have a lot of when I saw uh, a lot of um, his footage when he was on television he, he had quite a dry sense of humor I seem to remember and I don't know did Jobs did Steve Jobs have a good sense of humor I'm not sure to be honest, on that front. But he certainly had a vision, didn't he? Oh, absolutely having a vision. And, I mean, he loved that when he was standing there on the stage and he then had the uh, smartphone and he had that in his pocket and he took it up and saying that this will change the world. And everyone is sitting there looking, what, it's just a mobile phone. Um not realizing but he had the vision he had already seen what it could do and what would possibly happen so the vision absolutely humor now and then more cynical than humoristic yeah yeah more the imagination I mean you know it's the same really it's the same thing I mean what what I found Viktor Frankl did is that he he studied he, he thought about the meals that he would have when 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 he was out yeah. and I found that quite quite interesting and he would I think he would when he was running away you know he was in the in in the trench or whatever digging a digging a hole when he was doing some work some groundwork him and another prisoner would talk about you know some sort of fancy meals and they would imagine these meals that they'd be eating you know and but but I think you know he made it out alive right and he's he's he brought his own um spin on on psychology and 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 you know this logotherapy that that he talked about and I, I, we're so lucky that that these people before us have have shown us the way and shown us how they did it right and and that means that we get the freedom right because we're so free these days really most people are free to do whatever they want pretty much yeah mm-hmm. and but we get the freedom to choose. We get the freedom to choose how are we going to react? How are we going to handle this situation? Yeah. And, you know, I mean, back to the Queen of England, right? It, the Duke of Edinburgh, he launched, he launched the Duke of Edinburgh award scheme, right? And that is, that is totally all about resilience. It, mm. it, it really is because you're, you're going, I mean, what are you, 13 years old or something and you're, you're trekking across the UK up, up mountains and whatever for three or four days and, and doing, you know, reading a, a, a reading a map and, you know, all the old school stuff. Right. I don't know if they read maps anymore these days. I'm not sure, to be honest. No, but I don't, I, don't, I don't think they do. But I was thinking two people came to mind when we're talking about resilience now. Uh, both to whom I have a relationship with. The first one is um, um, Nick Vurich 
and he's also an Australian and he was born without no arms, no legs, and still he's saying no worries. I admire and him. He's giving people so much hope and he's saying, okay, if I can do it without arms and legs, what is your excuse with arms and legs for not doing it? So he is fantastic. And we have given the link to his videos in the book as well. But I was also thinking of uh, Dalai Lama, who I met a couple of times here and in India, and um, how he was also showing resilience when being thrown out of Tibet and walking through Tibet over to India, 1959. And no, when he came to India, the whole world's press were gathered and he had walked for a week to come over, over the mountains. And the whole press stood there and there were no country who took him in. He, he was homeless. I remember. And then India stretched up their arms and said, okay, we will give you some area that is your land. But that is also such a resilience. And then carry on. I mean, he was 17 years at the time. And then carry on for another 60 years as he's doing and trying to get uh, freedom for Tibet. I mean, that yeah. is a, also another person showing resilience. Yeah. I think, I think a lot of the people, the thing is, in your career, and in life, right? If you don't have resilience, you're never gonna you're never gonna move forwards, right? Because you're just not gonna do the work. Because you know, and we're gonna talk more about this in in further further audios and you know in the book. But I think the main thing for me as a person individually, I think really is working out why you started in the first place right and like why why do you want to do this in the first place what do you do it for right and getting in getting in touch with the reasons of why you get out of bed in the morning is something that for me was like a massive uh, a massive um, topic to think about on its own so we'll dig into that as well in uh, in future conversations thank you nelly and thanks everyone for listening thank you nathaniel Thanks so much for listening. Please subscribe and wherever you prefer, share with your friends. And if you enjoyed the show, drop us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen.